hierarchy, you know, and it seems as though really the construction, you know, of the uh, Soviet Union meant nothing in a, in a, in a certain way. It was only this kind of uh, great rhythm of life, you know. <laughs> well, that was my point. That is what you call life. Okay. okay. Uh, so, uh, no, 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 not so one, uh, uh, no, but there is another question at the, uh, uh, at the yes. bottom. Okay. Yes, You want Slava? It might be vaguely related, but I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, I want to do that. Okay. Okay. You will accuse me that it's not really a question. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to make a couple of reflections. First, the problem for me, I was deeply fascinated by this wonderful description you provided of this Vertovian utopia, where I think, to put it in this obscure Lacanian terms, he imagines precisely this pure vitality where there is no traumatic gaze in the Lacanian sense, gaze, blind spot, and so on and so on. Just this multiple vitality. And would you agree that precise I I would say that first I claim that this universe is inherently asexual. Virto was still part, do you know Boris Groys will be here next year maybe? I don't agree with him theoretically, but Not he published I recently, nonetheless in German, an interesting, interesting documentation mm -hmm. of the Russian Gnostic technocratic mechanist utopia of the 20s, which was precisely, you find it in Platonov and so on, mm -hmm. which was precisely ultimately to imagine communism as an asexual society, right? But okay, that's another story. I'm not just referring to uh, I deeply agree with your point about vertical split between this romantic fascination and plot. But would you agree now a couple of points because I will not. First, let me tell you a story which I find terribly amusing. And it tells a lot about how subversive it should be. The first time I saw Vertigo, it was in old communist Yugoslavia, and because Vertigo, you know, in the early 60s, because of some copyright trouble, it wasn't shown, so there was in Cinematheque an old copy, which was a bad copy, which means the last 20 seconds, 30, were missing. So for five years, I thought Vertigo is a film with a happy end. <laughs> after, uh, remember how it ends precisely, after uh, Judy confesses everything, they, there appeared to be a reconciliation. They are already, he forgives her embrace, and then in a totally, without any, at least superficial, mm. The film could have effectively ended at that point, mm -hmm. and we would have had kind of how to love, nonetheless, overcomes the obstacle. Mm -hmm. Then you can really, like kind of a ex nihilo from some the cherished domain, mm -hmm. the mother of sin, mother superior from hell. Mm -hmm. Another mental experiment, which is, I think, it makes your point about the gap absolutely crucial for Vertigo. Imagine Vertigo, exactly the same film, ending. Uh, after Madeleine's suicide. It's a perfectly consistent film of this tragic romantic kind about the destructive nature of male love, mm -hmm. if you love woman mm -hmm. too much, you push her to death, and so on and mm -hmm. so on. This would be kind of a platonic romanticism. Uh, it would be a film by Douglas Sirk, but just yeah. that's the point. Yeah. So, what, uh, do you know the, the wonderful text on, on, on Hitchcock by, on Vertigo by Jean-Pierre Dupuy? No, no. Uh, no, no, okay, he's not one of us politically, but... <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so many are not, so many are not. Because he demonstrated wonderfully what really happens to, to Scotty at the end. Why is he so traumatized? I think Hitchcock does a tremendous anti-platonic gesture then. It's not only that she is looking for a fatal woman and reality, the vulgar truth, it never fits the idea. Mm -hmm. It's something... He retroactively discovered that the ideal truly never existed. He doesn't lose the reality. Mm. He loses the idea. This is what shatters. Mm. It's not this platonic game of, mm. oh, I will never mm. found the mm. perfect woman. Mm. It's a kind of a mm. That's why he is totally broken at the end, which is another, did you notice if you read about Vertigo, an extremely interesting element? It is that how the end of the film mm. is described mm. 
by different uh, interpreters in a totally opposed way. Mm. Some people claim it's happy ending, he can look down, the last shot of the mm -hmm. film is uh, Scott mm -hmm. standing on mm -hmm. the tower, mm -hmm. so he got rid of the vertigo. Mm -hmm. There are others who think it's a totally ruined man, you cannot imagine mm -hmm. a deeper catastrophe mm -hmm. and so on. Mm -hmm. Another point about the gay, sorry, I will finish soon. You know what is the wonderful mystery of uh, Psycho, where do uh, you know a book by Esther Hasi, a guy like that, published on Vertigo? Yeah. You know what I know? You should read it. <laughs> Plus there, again, this is always a wonderful shift to my point, how practically all great interpreters make the same mistake. You have uh, one or two scenes, for example, you remember at the beginning in Ernest, the restaurant, mm -hmm. you have that famous shot in mm -hmm. profile, almost magic mm -hmm. of Marley. Mm -hmm. They all describe this shot as a point of view subjective shot. Mm. Look at it closely, it's mm. emphatically not. Mm. It's kind of an impossible, mm. but so this makes your point also about the case and so on and so on. So again, my, my point would have been here that Hitchcock does something pretty effective nonetheless there. First, it's not only that finally you succumb to this Wagnerian romantic Schopenhauerian mm. stuff, mm. he undermines it pretty, mm. Mm. pretty radically. Mm. Mm. At the end, you don't have this Wagnerian fullness of mm. life which is death. You have precisely a world in which this very Schopenhauerian will which seeks absolution disappears. Mm. Mm. At the same time, I think Hitchcock also, he plays a double game, undermines the plot. In the, same, in the sense that uh, 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 the point of the story is that, uh, is that nonetheless, the, the spectre persists. So you cannot simply say that Hitchcock just dismisses images. Another thing, then I will stop, don't be afraid. Uh, how Hitchcock plays the game precisely with this impossible traumatic gaze which mm. cannot be attributed. Mm. Did you notice a wonderful detail in Psycho? Sorry, in, uh, in here, in, in Vertigo. You remember after Scotty sends Madeleine mm. from water, we pass to his apartment mm. and the camera slowly moves mm. from uh, uh, Scotty sitting at the table, then above the kitchen thing you see the underwear of mm. yeah. Madeleine Judy, mm. then it moves on the door, the implication being clearly he brought her home, undressed her, put her to sleep. Okay, now do an experiment. Freeze, we can do it now if you don't believe me, if you have it. Uh, freeze the DVD on that point where you see uh, the underwear above the kitchen. Mm -hmm. It's not underwear. It's just abstract pieces of cloth and so on. Why? Uh, 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 censorship has code intervened. Mm -hmm. They said mm -hmm. if this is really underwear, it would have been a proof that Scott is saw Madeleine naked. Mm -hmm. But this shouldn't be a... Now what's here so mysterious mm -hmm. is that nobody of us even notices it. Who was the censorship protecting? I mean, we automatically think we see underwear. Here you have again your traumatic case and so on. I could go, go on, I love your text for five hours, but and he's the bad guy, this horrible, perverse, this German super ego. <laughs> Okay. So, so I think there was, there was a question. Uh, there was a, your question, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I do actually have a question. Um, my question would be that if, when Bertolt was making this film, and it was, um, as you said, that there was an equivalence between truth and appearance, um, not exactly at the same time, but around the same time, Medvedkin was also making films of this sort, where he was traveling around the country, filming the workers, but what he was filming, mm -hmm. I mean, we just we just covered this a, a couple of weeks ago in class. Mm -hmm. um, he was filming the uh, inequalities between what was being presented by the state and what was actually happening um, at the level of the cultus of the collective bar. And so there was this discrepancy between what was what was being presented as pravda as truth mm -hmm. and what was actually mm -hmm. true. Mm -hmm. And so Vertov's film was it actually truth? Or was it a Soviet version of truth in Pravda, like the newspaper, the main newspaper of Pravda, which they always said, everything that you read in Pravda is not Pravda. 
Okay. No, I think uh, uh, well. Uh, anyway, it, well, it's quite it, it's quite different. It, it, it's quite different because well, uh, Medvedkin. So Medvedkin was a filmmaker. So I think now you know about Medvedkin apparently. Uh, but uh, well, so Medvedkin as a filmmaker, you know, uh, as this idea of uh, kind of train. At the, at the same time, there was uh, there were of course the trains of Ajit Prop, you know. But uh, Medvedkin's train.